In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, the United States went to war with two countries, bombed four others, and spent over $6 trillion on combat and anti-terrorism measures. Its policies also helped create 21 million refugees and cause over 800,000 deaths. In Reign of Terror, national security reporter Spencer Ackerman argues that the war on terror also profoundly destabilized America and produced the Donald Trump presidency. He talks with reason about how to stop the growth in government surveillance and interventionism underwritten by overblown fears of terrorism. Spencer Ackerman, thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you very much for having me. All right. So your book is Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. What's the elevator pitch? Uh, the elevator pitch is that the 9-11 era, the war on terror, um, both in its culture and in its operations, is a doorway to the most nativist, most violent, and most racist elements of American history, that that door opens under cover of national emergency and once opened, provides the historical forces unleashed a pathway to power. And what they accomplish in power, particularly at first, um, from an operational level is not just uh, the wars themselves, but also uh, the transformation of the American security apparatus, which from my perspective on 9-11 is already over mighty, um, but the creation justification of um, outright unconstitutional actions, outright illegal actions, bulk surveillance at a scale never before um, seen in human history uh, because of what now the technological opportunities were, um, indefinite detention, um, not just uh, at Guantanamo Bay, um, but in you know battlefields and eventually um, uh, the holds of, of Navy ships. Um, torture, um, always illegal uh, under US law. Um, and the transformation of immigration from a mechanism of making more Americans into a counterterrorism apparatus that both funded um, immigration enforcement like it was counterterrorism, encouraged an attitude of immigration enforcement as counterterrorism, and ultimately treated immigrants as threats to those Americans still here. Um, it changes the presidency uh, into something like an elected king. Um, it treats uh, opposition um, as uh, the threat threshold of treason. It justifies its actions, most of which occur in secret, um, using euphemisms. Enhanced interrogation is not torture. Targeted killing is not anonymous assassination. And then outright lies. Um, it accomplishes all of this while, crucially, not naming an enemy, and thereby allowing a sense of the enemy to uh, arise that uh, is understood civilizationally. So people who have no more than superficial um, association at best um, with the murderous fanatics of Al Qaeda, people who perhaps come from the same countries they do, people who perhaps worship you know, one of the world's great religions, um, which Al Qaeda is exploiting, um, people who come from Muslim countries countries and so forth as the threat. Um, people who do not commit acts of violence, who do not plan acts of violence, and who instead most often than not are the victims of uh, jihadist terrorism. Um, simultaneously, that choice for the war on terror um, ensures that white terrorism Terrorism undertaken by the far right, terrorism uh, that considers itself uh, acts of patriotism, of restoration uh, against a disfigured um, and rapacious American government are not going to be treated 
in these similar ways. Let's and uh, then this, what, let me. I'm, I'm okay. wrapping up. I'm wrapping okay. up. It's a it's it's a long elevator. We're going. Yeah, I was going to say this is a we're space going to elevator. A sky, we're, going, yeah. we're going to a skyscraper. Okay. And then what happens is the wars themselves become disasters. And for a certain part of uh, the constituency that's been uh, manipulated to understand the war on terror in these ways. Uh, the agony of being at neither peace nor victory, the agony of having an America that they've understood to be this global hegemon, this unipolar power uh, with the ability and the right to shape world events as they wish, to act and not be acted upon, um, is placed in this excruciating cognitive dissonance caused by the war on terror. They go searching for explanations and Trump has them ready to go. Um, they are violence on civilizational scales, unrestrained by political correctness, by the fecklessness of elites, either Democratic, Republican, or in the security state, and those elites that had created the war on terror and now factionally aligned against Trump do not understand how the panoply of authoritarian possibilities that they created and they safeguarded all under a patina of lies could be manipulated to become its most authentic self right. under Donald Trump. Yeah, and uh, we'll get to that towards the end. But he, I mean, part of his genius, as it were, is that he says, you know, America is not innocent. America commits crimes. America commits war crimes. We can torture people. We have our past is not completely saccharine and we are losing. So let's let's change something. That's I mean, right. he's, and, and this he's is revealing, a, you know, he's simultaneously calling for a return to American greatness and saying, you know what, we we are also capable of horrible things in the name of our great ideals. That's right. And this is nothing new. This is a very deep current in American history. If you read uh, uh, the you know, rise of the Jacksonians when they displace the political coalition that the founders create, this is kind of their shtick that you know, what makes America great, what allows for all, all manner of American wealth and power um, is not you know, merely the virtue of America's ideas, allegedly. It's the ability of people to exercise extreme violence in order um, and operate under conditions of impunity um, in order to outwardly expand American power. And it doesn't matter who you kill um, in order to do that. Yeah, let's uh, talk about continuities first. As we, you know, uh, the book, uh, by the way, one of its main contributions, I think, and, and this is giant for me, is that you recover a history that is not even really old. But I, you know, I, would, I was working at Reason. I was covering this stuff every day, every hour of every day as it was unfolding. And your book is an incredible treasure trove of all of these stories that were absolutely the most important thing in the world for, it could be weeks at a time, but certainly hours and days, and we've forgotten them. So just the rich, thick history that you're giving of real time from 9-11 on. But I want to start with the continuities that you alluded to. The American security state and the surveillance state, uh, you know, that gets encoded in the Patriot Act a couple of, you know, shortly after the 9-11 attacks was nothing new. Can you talk a little bit about how what was going on in the 90s kind of was able to get weaponized, uh, uh, operationalized after 9-11 because of what happened? And what, what is the essential continuity before, you know, September 10th America and September 12th America? So just on the, the level of um, surveillance um, and on the expansion of law enforcement powers, um, the important continuity um, begins after uh, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, when the FBI starts uh, really um, beginning to look at um, American Muslims uh, who it fears have some sort of tie uh, to the um, World Trade Center bombing um, and, and find that uh, their investigative aperture um, would be really great if it could expand. Um, because part of the problem is these connections aren't really significant. They, you know, we're talking about, you know, people who are around the same people, uh, not people who were 
plotters who the FBI didn't find, but that's an operational FBI assumption. And so it goes, you know, looking for opportunities. It finds one in the most perverse possible sense, um, which is uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing by Timothy McVeigh, a white supremacist who is very familiar with the warren of white supremacist militant safe havens in the United States, the sort of things in northeastern Oklahoma um, left untouched that uh, the United States will, after 9-11, hector, you know, Pakistan for, you know, maintaining these sanctuaries and not going after the extremists in your midst. Um, meanwhile, this is exactly what the United States does. This is not something unfamiliar. This is something deeply familiar, but we're not allowed um, by the force of the interpretations provided to us after 9-11 to see those essential continuities. Um, after this horrific terrorist attack, the worst at that point in American history, um, the FBI, Congress, and the Justice Department start looking for expansions of what's called material support law. Material support uh, for terrorism is this emerging body of law. Um, you can find it at, I think it's uh, 2339 uh, Alpha and Bravo of the US code, um, whereby uh, penalties start increasing and accruing and accordingly um, investigative abilities start expanding. Um, in order to find and charge, functionally criminalize, uh, people and organizations that provide something that aids first a terrorist attack, and then after Oklahoma City, a terrorist entity. Um, increasingly, after Oklahoma City, um, they change material support law um, in order to um, criminalize people who no longer have any connection with any act of violence. They can be part of a nonviolent aspect of terrorism and still face similar culpability. All of this happens only toward terrorism that has a, quote, foreign, unquote, nexus. The, the law responding to Oklahoma City, in other words, expressly made sure that it excluded domestic, which is to say white, which is to say far right, terrorism only focusing on foreign, which is to say Muslim um, terrorism. That is the bedrock that the Patriot Act starts building on top of within weeks of 9-11, um, adding not just to um, material support, uh, particularly uh, sentencing uh, aspects, but also now expanding um, the ability of the FBI uh, to collect records without probable cause warrants, um, often unilaterally served in something either called administrative subpoenas or national security letters on, uh, um, third party businesses that host everyone's records. And this is where we really start getting into an exceptionally dangerous and um, long lasting criminalization of association, association being guaranteed by the First Amendment. Yeah. Uh, uh, talk about how that plays out under Bush, uh, you know, in the in the you know months after 9-11 turning into years. Let's talk first about the way in which the Bush administration kind of pushed the surveillance envelope or, or created, a, you know, and argued for and, and either won legislatively or just did what they wanted. Uh, let's talk about the surveillance apparatus and the way that that affects Americans at home. And then let's talk about the, the wars in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. But how did the Bush administration go about expanding the ability of the government essentially to uh, do whatever it wanted in the name of uh, fighting terrorism? So TLDR. Um, the CIA and the National Security Agency, um, I guess you could say the FBI too in some important respects, get entirely out of the post 1970s, the post Watergate uh, passel of both laws and um, governmental norms uh, that inhibited things like mass spying on American citizens. Um, they do this in a variety of ways. Some uh, are the Patriot Act. Um, others are something that uh, one of the heroes of the hashtag resistance, um, the NSA and eventual CIA director, Mike Hayden, sets up at the National Security Agency, where he just decides to violate the Fourth Amendment at scale. He sets up something called Stellar Wind. Stellar Wind uh, is a passel, um, you might say a constellation of uh, bulk surveillance activities. It collects 
for a very long time all Americans' phone records. It collects all Americans' international um, email and internet usage records. Um, it, uh, in particular, um, does so in such a way that no member of Congress except the Gang of Eight, the political and intelligence leadership, um, know about this um, at a time when this obviously would not be in any sense good if it happened, but in such a way that even uh, an NSA uh, draft inspector general's report from 2009 notes that if they had just asked Congress to do it, Congress probably would have done it. They just decide to violate the law instead because they feel that um, the president's authorities at times of war are such as in elected kings, where um, the legislative and judicial branches of government are more like consultative bodies. Um, they can be ignored rather than um, uh, rather than at, rather than uh, being obliged, rather than the presidency being obliged to obey them. Um, they also do things like um, mass roundups of uh, particular immigrants um, with the dangle that if they inform on their neighbors, they might find a quicker pathway to citizenship. Um, there are tremendous uh, roundups in New York City and in uh, the greater Washington area um, amongst the consequences of FBI um, overbearing scrutiny uh, particularly after they go after um, a false church based imam on uh, potential uh, prostitution charges, is they radicalize a guy known as Anwar Awlaki, who will go on to become uh, the most important Al Qaeda propagandist in English. Um, so the war on terror not only unleashes these authoritarian possibilities that have less and less to do um, with actually um, stopping acts of terrorism than they have with expanding, basically winning an argument um, within uh, certain elite circles about the nature of um, American power broadly and presidential power specifically. Yeah. Can you speak to the question, this, this used to be brooded about a lot, um, and it's kind of faded as the Patriot Act or its, you know, its offspring have kind of passed into general whatever. Uh, was there much useful uh, intelligence gathered through these overset boundaries? Did they, you know, did the government stop, uh, you know, endless numbers or large numbers of terrorist attacks or anything like that? Or was this, you know, kind of like, well, they got a lot of information and they did certain things, but it had very little to do with keeping Americans safe from terrorism? The fact is, is that terrorism, particularly high profile terrorism like 9 11, um, is just not very widespread and not many American Muslims, uh, the, the American Muslims who were, uh, were most often inclined toward acts of violence were pushed toward those acts of violence by FBI informants. Um, the basic problem that they confronted was that terrorism is not frequent enough to pose this sort of threat. And there's a lot of self-deception and a lot of outright lies. I was one of the reporters on uh, the Guardian's um, reporting team for the Snowden stories. And then, you know, if ever there was going to be internal documentation of real terrorist attacks that surveillance activities stopped, it would have been the motherfucking NSA. And guess what wasn't in that document trove? Instead, it showed how frequently American political leaders of both parties both lied and permitted the security apparatus to lie to the public about what this violation of American freedom at scale actually accomplished. Yeah, could you talk a little bit, one of, the, one of the real strengths of the book is that you go through, you know, the Bush administration and liberal and conservative complicity, Obama, Trump, et cetera. What, you know, in, particularly during the years of the Bush uh, administration, uh, focusing on, uh, uh, you know, national security and the need for overwhelming surveillance like that kept the Republicans in power. I mean, the 2004 election, when a lot of things were going south for Bush, you know, he essentially won it by saying this is about, you know, this is about 9-11. Um, what was in it for liberals or why were so many liberals in Congress and in the kind of elite culture? Why were they so willing to 
you know, and they, these are people who are baby boomers, people who were raised on, you know, what the Vietnam War, Watergate, the revelations in the 70s of the way that the NSA, the CIA and the FBI had completely abrogated all legal restriction on their abilities to surveil American citizens. Why was there so much liberal complicity with, you know, the post 9-11 surveillance state? Because the liberal complicity that we by and large see um, is the complicity of the upper middle class. Um, liberalism is not leftism. It's leftism that emerges, it's socialism in particular, um, socialist traditions that I identify with, that emerges from uh, the, you know, the Watergate years, from, from Cold War anti-communism with a thoroughgoing critique of you know, the, the one that's kind of similar to the, the one you allude to about uh, the perfidies of the national security state, its relationship uh, towards um, anti-democratic repression at home, uh, the wellspring it provides for nativism and racism. Um, and all of this, um, forgive me reason listeners, uh, in the service of capital. And uh, it is liberals, however, um, who look at this and want primarily um, to identify uh, with the technocratic elements of the American government, the expertise in places like the State Department, um, eventually the CIA, the military and so forth, um, that see foreign policy as, you know, if they are, you know, from, the, from their perspective is, you know, the democratic elite, um, something, you know, that can potentially destroy the coalition um, that does rely I, um, in many ways on uh, leftists with nowhere else to go electorally. Um, and also uh, want to feel good about America and tell a good story about America. They see, they want out of the culture wars of the 1990s in particular, um, the, uh, the unpleasantness between the Republicans and Bill Clinton. And that's why you see a tremendous number of liberal journalists um, in mainstream publications writing things about the virtues of war after 9-11 because war will, the war on terror in particular, will kind of revive a national unity and a sense of purpose, will reassert American power in a world that they believe the Twin Towers have proven um, badly lacks it. It is a very old current in liberalism. You can trace it all the way back um, to, at the very least, uh, um, the, uh, I forget, the restored Bourbon King um, of France, I think it was Charles X, um, who invades and occupies Algeria, um, and um, Tocqueville, who apologizes um, and justifies, um, at the same time of his liberalism, the glory of French empire. This is something that is very rooted in the United States and American liberalism. Uh, as well, it is also the result of uh, a kind of recrudescence of the Cold War, where national politics play very familiar roles on kind of players in national politics play very familiar roles on a set that remains still dressed from the Cold War. And so there's a tremendous amount of liberal fear of this weaponized patriotism that they don't want to have inflicted upon them. The, the war on terror from the start is a right-wing political cudgel and it's liberals who are already, you know, particularly the wealthier they are, normally inclined towards um, a very defensive stance um, rather than one that socialists um, and leftists wanted to put up after 9-11, which was one of resistance to these things. And I guess uh, partly this is the difference between say a Bernie Sanders and a Hillary Clinton. Uh, there's also, I, I mean, as you're alluding in the Cold War, liberals were not uh, you know, after the fact, they were painted as uh, unpatriotic and unwilling to fight the Cold War. But in fact, as Liberals Bob Dole, built the Cold War. Yeah, uh, Bob Dole, you know, was when he talked about Democrat wars in 1976 as a vice presidential candidate, he was pointing to people like FDR and LBJ as cold warriors, essentially, and willing to go anywhere and pay any price. There's um, a fun analog if you want to have time to get into it. Um, if you read Dean Acheson's memoir, President of the Creation, Acheson, who's Truman's Secretary of State, who is like the book promises, you know, from Jump, is one of the architects of the Cold War, writes with frequent irritation um, and disgust at uh, people like Richard Nixon, 
who are playing anti-communist politics against him and saying that um, you know the people who build the architecture of the Cold War are like Atchison's you know college of cowardly commies or something. I forget what the actual thing is. And Atchison very revealingly, he's from a very patrician family, he's a banker. Um, calls this in um, this book that was written around um, the Vietnam War era, the attack of the primitives. So there's already like this simultaneous class prejudice that's expressed with that um, while, and you know, against someone like Richard Nixon of all people, um, while simultaneously not understanding how the political forces that they are playing with um, are deeply dangerous and can be dangerous to them as well. And that's something we see from liberals all throughout the war on terror. Uh, this is uh, uh, just to uh, uh, get uh, the audience to understand the, you know, the, the hysteria of the moment. And this takes place in 2008. You mentioned in the notes to your book afterwards, all some of the things you left out. And there was one episode that I think is, is really telling. Uh, and this had to do in 2008, Michelle Malkin, uh, who is whose star has faded somewhat. She really emerged as a new media phenomenon in the early 20th century uh, on the wake of uh, of 9-11, uh, going so far as to publish a book defending internment of Japanese Americans. Um, but in 2008, she attacked Dunkin' Donuts and Rachel Ray, the cooking show uh, host, um, you know, for a particular type of iced coffee ad. Can you... Discuss that episode a little bit uh, and what that reveals about the kind of baseline hysteria that America was in after the 9-11 attacks. So first, I think it's important to point out that what the episode uh, shows is that like when we talk about a baseline hysteria, I don't believe and I don't think the record shows that it's really an organic hysteria. It is a hysteria that results from years and years of journalistic and political elites um, pushing interpretations of the 9-11 attack in these civilizational directions. Um, you know, I, um, so that said, um, the hysteria is nevertheless real. I just don't wanna suggest that the war on terror, which is always an elite creation, is anything that bubbles up from below and creates a demand on politicians to respond to, which is their typical alibis uh, for doing the things they do. Um, Rachel Ray is the spokesperson, Rachel Ray from the Food Network, like one of the most inoffensive possible um, people in American public life, particularly, you know, in that era of the Food Network, which is yeah. just very- Yeah, no, she's very, a very great bubbly. minute. She's you know a great saying? American, 30 minutes giving, you know, every night of the week meals. giving us, this. giving us good meals that are nutritious and tasty and can be done quickly. I've learned a lot of things. Yeah, no, Rachel, Rachel Ray, Ray is, is, is a real American. She's on my Mount Rushmore. She's a spokesperson for Dunkin' Donuts selling iced coffee. Um, and in one of these ads, she's wearing, I wish I was making this up, she's wearing a scarf that kind of, sort of, could be confused for a keffiyeh. Or, as Michelle Malkin calls it, the traditional scarf of Arab men that has come to symbolize murderous Palestinian jihad. Dunkin' Donuts pulls the ad. They're like, because you might have worn something that an absolute like carnival barking racist clown would say is reminiscent of something that Arabs wear, Arabs who are coming to kill your grandmother, that is considered too politically controversial um, for a corporation like Dunkin' Donuts, which is acting in a certain, by the logic of the war on terror. Um, the Dunkin' Donuts, you know, higher ups are acting in a way that you might say is rational in the context of this deep irrationality in the context of this persecution. And it also shows, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, like really in miniature, what we would say today is that the war on terror's culture is a cancel culture. It's censorious, it is devoted in, uh, as a first principle um, to policing speech, to ensuring um, the absolute unacceptability um, 
uh, to deny respectability um, to very wide swaths of interpretation about 9-11 and then about the war on terror. Um, and it will operate civilizationally. And if you transgress from those boundaries, as a lot of people did, not even knowing they were doing so, um, the cancellation would come for them. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just to uh, be clear, what Rachel Way was, Ray was wearing in those ads is something you can pick up on any street corner when it gets chilly in New York for $5. It's, it's a just, scarf. It's a it's black a scarf. and white scarf. It it may look vaguely like something that uh you know that um, Yasser Arafat wore at some point, but it's insane. And the rhetoric around that was that somehow Rachel Ray was either knowingly or unknowingly signaling to her Al Qaeda masters that you know dimitude was upon us. And notice that you know when Malkin is talking, she's not even talking about Al Qaeda, murderous Palestinian jihad. We, we've 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 passed long ago, several exits ago, on the freeway of the war on terror. Was any real identification with either its activities or its culture with combating Al Qaeda? This was something that very quickly became far more civilizational, and now has killed by most by the most recent estimate of the Costs of War Project at Brown University, a very analytically conservative um, estimate, 900,000 people. Uh, let's talk about that jump from going after, you know, Al-Qaeda or the people responsible, specifically responsible for 9-11, to this broad-based war on terror, which actually then, you know, has us occupying Afghanistan, invading and occupying Afghanistan for 20 years, uh, Iraq for years on end. What was do you think that the categorical error of saying you know like certain people were responsible for 911 we we need to find out who they were take care of them and understand the larger context of you know what what was motivating them and obviously we're not going to deal with that in America uh, you know for a long time to come but who were the people who were responsible to saying okay it is now it is our entire countries especially a country like Iraq which um you know if if there is a war of choice, Iraq defines it for America. Um, do you think the Bush administration and his uh, and their many enablers in Congress and in the press did they fully you know did they understand that they were making a categorical switch from people who were responsible to nine eleven to something else, or were they I mean were they being mendacious about that because this was a way of extending um, or, or continuing uh, power for America, both it, domestically as well as abroad? No, I think um, they were both uh, knowledgeable and sincere about what they were doing. It's a very important moment when Bush delivers um, his State of the Union address in January of 2002. That's really the moment where all of these months after 9-11, where Bush starts talking about how the war on terror is going to be long, it begins with Al-Qaeda, but it doesn't end there and so forth, really finds its expression and its purpose. And that's the famous axis of evil speech um, where um, he says, you know, Iran and Iraq, um, you know, states like these and their terrorist allies um, constitute an axis of evil. North Korea is thrown in there so it doesn't see, you know, for window dressing, um, despite the fact that North Korea is by far the biggest, you know, actual threat, um, you know, particularly from um, a nuclear weapons perspective. Um, and so at that point, you know, you, you remember from the time that like this was not a subtle thing. This was not something that anyone, you know, missed the point about that the war on terror is leveling up, that this was a deliberate decision by Bush, justified by a lot of people, um, you know, liberals as well as conservatives. And it results importantly from all of this, you know, rhetoric that's placed around the war on terror from, you know, not just politicians, but intellectuals and journalists as well, that, you know, the war on terror is this enervating enterprise. It knits the United States back together. It gives us grand purpose of a sense that we lacked in the 1990s. There are people who would write stupid shit like how, like, the 9-11 attacks meant it was the end of irony, whatever the fuck that's supposed to mean. And, you know, something like that is just not going to be satisfied with, like, 
you know, arresting the people who are responsible for 9-11 and bringing them to trial. It won't be satisfied with killing the people who were responsible for 9-11 and then ending it and then moving it on. It's looking for this kind of grand purpose. That's part of the design. It, you know, only when, you know, it starts getting, you know, really real and Bush has to like sell the invasion of Iraq, does Bush start doing like the outright lie stuff about manufacturing a connection between Saddam Hussein and Al Qaeda. Do you think, you know, and he's recently dead, so we can talk even more freely about him, but do you think that um, Donald Rumsfeld I was, I mean, there's a strong case, and anybody who watches the Errol Morris documentary interview with him, there's a strong case that Donald Rumsfeld was totally delusional. But did Rumsfeld believe what he said about various connections, or was he just lying? He was just uh, lying. He was just lying. In he, this, do we know, like, is that in the service of a greater good? Or? Yeah, he wanted to invade Iraq. Yeah. He wanted to, right. dem- more importantly than Iraq, this is all very abstract, because in an important way, the thing that I want to really convey after reporting on uh, the national security state um, and the politicians around it for 20 years is that in really important ways, um, people who aren't them aren't people. People who the United States targets and kills, people who um, American power interacts with violently aren't really people. They're abstractions. I don't really know. I could find, you know, all number of euphemistic ways to put that, but what's the fucking point? Yeah. Um, um, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, um, as well as George W. Bush, but in particular Rumsfeld and Cheney, wanted to prove certain points about American power, about uh, the international order, who sets it, who is not bound by it, and how it ought to operate. That is the meaning of everything Rumsfeld and Cheney said, whether they actually thought um, there were you know, genuine threats to emerge um, from you know, Al-Qaeda and so forth, I'll be charitable and assume they did. I have no problem with that. Um, the fact of the matter is what they built in every particular killed and displaced. They killed hundreds of thousands of people, probably more. They displaced tens of millions. They immiserated so many more. They enriched the defense industry, the winners of the war on terror is basically America's version of state capitalism, which is an engine of death. It's the arms, it's the arms export industry, it's the defense industry, it's the surveillance industry. Those guys win the war on terror. Right. Everyone else. And I, I, I want to point out this is uh, this spiel that you're on, which is very good, is also uh, you know the grounds for a uh, libertarian leftist coalition because this you is, know we've been in these are where these things come that. together. Yeah, you know we've been about that so, since the very beginning. By the end of the Bush years, uh, you know, there's the finance, you know, the non insignificant uh, issue of the financial crisis, financial collapse. Uh, we would argue, I think, about the uh, the the reasons for that, et cetera. But um, there's that. But the war on terror, or the, certainly the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, have been widely discredited. Um, you know, the, something bad has happened. Obama. Barack Obama is elected. He wins the Democratic nomination over Hillary Clinton in part because he is somehow perceived as the peace candidate. Um, And he talks about Iraq as a dumb war and he talks about he doesn't really talk about Afghanistan. But once he's elected, uh, he starts going about ultimately tripling troop strength in Afghanistan and recreating what you call a sustainable war on terror. Talk a little bit about the moment when Obama takes over and then what what is he doing with the war on terror, both to reform it, but ultimately to extend it. So first, um, there were reporters, myself on the left, Eli Lake on the right, um, who all throughout Obama's candidacy um, were writing about like, on the one hand, this is the most anti-war candidate um, in like very recent political memory. But on the other hand, when you actually look at what he's saying, there are very strong limits on how he would go about undoing the war on terror. Obama is against the Iraq war and he's against torture and on everything else he's flexible. Throughout the 2008 campaign, Obama was still saying that he would escalate in Afghanistan. He never, in fact, this is a misperception um, created by, I think, a lazy media. He never actually says the words good war. Um, But nevertheless, he describes the, the war. Basically, one of these things is a, you know, 
horrific calamity, the Iraq War, and the other is, you know, a troubled, valorous enterprise that the United States may not wish to take up, but nevertheless has no choice if we're to be safe from terrorism. Um, Obama wants ultimately in office, after he uh, votes to make permanent uh, as a senator, um, once it looks like he might really be president, um, a lot of the NSA surveillance that he had previously criticized. Um, once in office, he seeks to make the war on terror um, less uh, conspicuous. He wants to withdraw from Iraq. He nevertheless escalates in Afghanistan after um, receiving the advice that if you do this once, you can accomplish what the generals want accomplished and then you can start withdrawing. Um, but what he also wants is this apparatus um, that can uh, ensure that he is not soft on terrorism, that can ensure that um, if there is a genuine terrorist threat, um, he is there to meet it. He doesn't accomplish this by, I think what you know would make a lot more sense, um, dismantling the architecture of American power that violently uh, dominates the Middle East and drives the reception um, to a violent response. He does it instead by constructing different violent responses that are just less visible. Drone strikes, which he becomes synonymous with. Um, the coalescing of NSA surveillance, which left alone because of the way it operates will only expand, particularly as it becomes synonymous with 21st century capitalism. Um, and the data generation and then commodification and arbitrage um, that defines um, a lot of the information economy. Um, and not just the information economy, but it's an adjunct to pretty much like, you know, Target is a data company, right? Um, so uh, all of that together, uh, Obama codifies under um, what he believes is greater fidelity to the rule of law. In fact, what he does is assemble intelligence officials, lawyers, um, and uniform military officers, along with you know, senior political appointees that basically meet to decide who lives and who dies. That is what's known as the disposition matrix. It's not lawful, it just has a lot of lawyers involved in it. And among the decisions they come to is that you can execute an American citizen without charge or without trial provided that a security agency, like in this case, the CIA, says it would just be too darn hard to apprehend. And I would suggest to you that this is really the legacy from a national security perspective of Barack Obama, the um, maintenance of what uh, the philosopher Giorgio Agamben describes uh, famously as a state of exception, but now entirely made respectable um, and uh, with a legacy created for it for liberals who will go on to maintain it. And we are seeing a lot of that um, right now, um, the Afghanistan withdrawal notwithstanding in the Biden administration. Yeah, Agamben, uh, who's uh, heavily influenced by Michel Foucault, uh, is a prophet of both the war on terror as well as the COVID age. He got roasted early on when he critiqued um, certain measures that the state of Italy or the Italian government was taking. Um, but he he's somebody who everybody should know and read with special care, I think. Um, yeah, I don't want to co-sign for a lot of what he said. No, no, about, no. no about but I mean, COVID, but this but is yeah, very, very, very prophetic. This is. Terror, yeah. Said. But the state of exception is, you know, he he argues essentially and I think pretty persuasively that many liberal democracies get to a point where it is a constant state of exception. And somehow it is the. Um, you know, the uh, overreach that actually legitimates the order, you know, the, the, the limited government order you're trying to preserve by, you know, saying we really need to do things differently now just for a short period of time. But we keep coming up with ways to extend government overreach, surveillance, things like that. Um, so that one of the things that's fascinating is that even as Obama was legitimizing or, or putting on a, a kind of firmer ground, whether it's legal or cultural or political, Aspects of the war on terror, you write about how the the right, though, manages to keep getting to the right of him and saying, you know what, Obama, you know, this secret Muslim uh, who may or may not be American is actually not going far enough. How did that play out? So, again, the wars by the time of Obama's presidency are disasters. They're exhausting. They 
were um, meant to demonstrate the might of America um, and in fact only demonstrate its weakness. And in that agony, for those who believe in American exceptionalism, um, there is a tendency, particularly given you know, the context of a war that has unleashed and legitimized all of these nativist impulses, um, to say that the war is internally betrayed, to say that um, the fault of the war is not the war, the fault of the war is not um, the thing itself, but you, know, you start seeing this very early on in the Iraq war, um, from people around the Weekly Standard who had supported it, um, who had said who become never Trumpers, or in Tucker Carlson's case, become supreme Trumpers, um, who start to say that the problem with the Iraq war is the Iraqis. We are seeing a respectable version of that right now with Joe Biden blaming the Afghans for the Afghanistan war. Um, it's, it's really disgusting. I don't mean to say that um, you know, only the right plays with those politics. My book extensively documents the um, liberals playing with those politics. Um, I mean to say that those politics exist and express themselves in these very familiar patterns because they are very deeply American, something that's in the firmware before we go, you know, politically um, to, you know, the left or the right or wherever. Even peeling it back a little bit, Obama's, uh, you know, his immigration policies were, you know, to the extent that you can say anything good about George Bush is that he was not the most anti-immigrant president of the 21st century because exactly. uh, he's been followed by two who were worse on that. So, And again, you get this weird thing where Obama is deporting, arresting, and removing record numbers of immigrants, and yet he is not doing enough. And, and in 2008, uh, Mitt Romney runs, or I'm sorry, 2012, Mitt Romney says, you know, this guy is not doing anything to get rid of immigrants. Yeah, so Obama, like the war on terror itself, is not understood um, by what you know, they actually do. Um, it's understood in a cultural sense and in a civilizational sense. The most important, remember the most important thing about um, the rights reaction to Obama um, is really summed up by birtherism, which, which tells you a lot about the war on terror as well. It's this gigantic conspiracy theory, again, very familiar not only in the war on terror, but throughout American history, uh, very often, I don't think we allow ourselves to understand like how deeply American conspiracy theories are, particularly in an era where um, elites over-attribute conspiracy theories um, to these pathologically fucked up Muslim countries. Um, but uh, it is ironic that, any, anyway, uh, you can cut that bit out. Um, Obama is understood uh, um, in certain quarters of the right uh, as um, a secret Muslim that, you know, the anti-Black racism of birtherism is like right there on the package. And it's so obvious that it can tend to obscure how the war on terror is working there. What birtherism is telling you is that because Barack Obama is secretly a foreign Muslim, he's your enemy. Barack Obama doesn't have your interests at heart. Barack Obama is among the people who have been trying to kill you since 9-11, that makes any compromise. I mean, how could you possibly, um, if that is your critique of Obama, and remember, this is Donald Trump's critique of Obama. Um, this is not something that doesn't enjoy purchase on the right. This either people with power on the right either wink at this or pretend it's not happening. Most often they accommodate it. And that is the meaning of what happens uh, for the rights reaction throughout the Obama years, that um, you know, as the wars grow so horrific, you start seeking satisfaction closer to home. A cultural center in Lower Manhattan becomes a ground zero mosque or a victory mosque. Um, states controlled by Republicans um, around the country uh, start trying to ban so-called Sharia law. Um, and just because there's an absurdity to that effort, we shouldn't recognize what's at work there, which is a deliberate attempt at curtailing Muslim civil rights and expanding the punitive aspects of the state um, into um, like the, the fundamental aspects of freedom that, that Muslims enjoy in America. Um, this is what, all, and you know, then after um, ISIS happens, the migrant outflows from the war on terror um, lead to powerful political figures on the right 
um, and not only the right, but you know, very often on the right, treating refugees from ISIS is indistinct from ISIS, which is exactly what we've been seeing um, in with uh, Afghanistan. Exactly. Yeah. You know, refugees from the Taliban, including those who actually served the war effort as being no different from the Taliban. These are very, yeah, these are very like well-trod patterns in the war on terror because they're well-trod patterns in American history. Um, Kit, just for the record, you don't think that criticizing or opposing Barack Obama is necessarily proof of racism? Not, I mean, look, if, if it is proof of racism, I'm guilty of it. Okay. The whole That's, middle section yeah. of my book, everything that I reported throughout the Obama years was critical of Obama. What I have absolutely no patience with is any form of white supremacy. What I have absolutely no patience with is uh, criticism of Obama based not on what he does, but on who he is. Right. Um, let's talk about in the time we have left, I want to talk about Trump and get to Biden and what uh, if the war on terror era is over, what comes next or how will you know, how do we work to uh, make sure that it's over um, with Donald Trump? Uh, what was his ultimate impact on the war on terror? Because one of the things that is interesting about Trump as a political figure is that he, you know, um, in many ways is baldly stating certain types of horrifying, you know, truths that people usually want gussied up when he went on, you know, very five minutes into announcing he was going to be president. He started talking about how Mexicans are rapists and drug dealers and, they're, you know, the country's not sending its best, uh, kind of articulating crassly what probably a fair number of Americans actually believed or worried about. By the same token, he also called out the military industrial complex at various points. He is the one who said, you know what, we should get out of Afghanistan. We should get out of Syria. What, how, do, how do you summarize not who he is, which, you know, he's gone, but what is his ultimate impact on the kind of military industrial complex or the surveillance security industry in America? Well, Donald Trump's reputation for being against the war on terror is the result of uh, paying attention to only what he says and none of what he does. In office, he escalates the war on terror across the board. He escalates in Afghanistan, which the only exception there is, and I write in the book that I think this is the most valorous act of a disgraceful presidency, he was willing to negotiate a withdrawal with the Taliban. He was the one who recognized that the Taliban was an ineradicable fact, something that both the Bush and the Obama administrations simply, even when in the Obama administration's case, they knew it, simply did not do and went along um, out of political cowardice um, that consigned so many, not just Americans, but mostly Afghans to death. Remember as well, um, during the lead up to the war in Iraq, how uh, the neoconservatives fought so fiercely a battle not just of policy, but of legitimacy with uh, the CIA and particularly their intelligence analysts and the State Department and the uniformed military, symbols of American power that supposedly by the logic of 9-11, which venerates the capital T troops, um, are supposed to be sacrosanct. But in fact, they're not sacrosanct because they're obstacles to what uh, the war on terror uh, has as its interests, as articulated by the most, you know, fervent of its architects. Um, this is a prelude to where Donald Trump will go. It's a prelude that, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, Richard Nixon um, and anti-communist attacks on uh, these, you know, technocratic and capital R rational elements of Cold War literal liberalism. This is a very, very, very old pattern, um, visible especially um, in uh, mid to late 20th century American history, where um, the public respect reserved for those in whose name um, the war on terror is being fought is entirely expendable when those people from that background prove to be obstacles to the enterprise. Trump's innovation is that the enterprise here doesn't need to be America. It just needs to be him and his faction. So uh, surveillance on him because of his rampant criminality is uh, corrupt cops gone mad trying to rob you of your political power, not Trump of his own um, you know, wealth and freedom. And accordingly, um, 
obstacles to Trump's agenda uh, can be dismissed that way. They also have the benefit of being obstacles um, to the erosion, or rather, they also have the benefit of being, you know, manifestations of what remains of the rule of law. And if you get rid of those things, you're getting two for the price of one. If you're someone like Trump, but does that really? Oh, yeah. now remember, surveillance. You can read this in every single year of uh, uh, the ODNI's uh, reports about surveillance that they put on uh, their Tumblr, which Marcy Wheeler. Uh, felicitously uh, calls icon the record. Um, surveillance on everyone else expands under the Trump administration. The FBI sifts through for an entire year, keeps the secret, sifts through uh, Americans collected data that the NSA has stored with entirely without a warrant in violation of the rule of the few rules that it has to um, certify uh, to a secret surveillance court. Yeah, so already we're very, very far down the road of like, you know, an undemocratic surveillance enterprise responsive, you know, pra practically speaking to no representative body. Um, all of that, you know, accelerates under the Trump years. The drone strikes accelerate. No matter, you know, Trump is playing very good politics because of the unpopularity of the war on terror when he says we need to get out of Afghanistan, we need to get out of Syria, but then he doesn't do it. No one, you know, there's a war in Somalia right now. It is old enough for a quinceanera. Congress has never so much as studied a war that's 15 years old. No administration fights the war in Somalia as intensely and as bloodily as Donald Trump does. And that's entirely overlooked. I guess here here's a question as we we talk about Biden and, and what comes next or, or where we're at. But, you know, there's no question that Trump to broad swaths of America, um, possibly even his own supporters. But let's say there's 40 percent of that. There's 60 percent of people who are against him. Does he delegitimate? Did he delegitimate the American intelligence service uh, and the surveillance state as well as the you know, the, the political apparatus by shitting on it so much, as well as then enacting a bunch of kind of insane policies. And I guess that's one question. And the other is, what is the role of public opinion in any of this? Um, I recently talked with Stephen Wertheim, a historian who uh, talked about the rise of military supremacy as the, as the ultimate goal of American foreign policy starting in, in the World War II era. And he talked a lot about Walter Lippmann, who was an architect of that. And Lippmann, of course, is famous for saying, you know, the public doesn't know anything, but it doesn't really matter because the public doesn't really influence anything. What I guess at the end of the Trump presidency, you know, the presidency is held in very low esteem. American government is held at record low esteem. Congress, you know, you go through all of this. Nobody is feeling good about the FBI, the CIA, the NSA, anything like that. Does that matter at all? Or is that really you know, interesting, but that's not where the decisions get made. Well, I think it matters, but it matters, you know, when we look at what the substance of the criticism of the CIA, the FBI, the security state um, is, because the criticism that emerges on the right is that this is an out of control criminal enterprise because it goes after the people I don't like right. and leaves alone, seemingly, the people right. I like. So Not the problem because, is- Let me continue. Yeah. Let me continue. Okay. Not because this is an enterprise that is violating the Constitution on everyone at scale. Those are two very different propositions. I think there is an impulse amongst, um, I think, well-intentioned people on the right who do hold the right, in my opinion, critique of the security state to want to leverage that extant anger um, in order to, um, you know, roll back the security state. Um, the trouble is, is I don't think you get there from here. I don't right. think you so get it's there. that yeah. those people are saying like, you know, what's wrong with the national or, you know, the security state is it spying on Donald Trump That's right. for bad reasons, not that it is doing that to everybody on else. You, your aunt, yeah. your grandma. And especially dark people overseas or, or who are ruining exactly my little league because, games. Yeah. Exactly okay. Because like they don't, you know, look, Section 702 of FISA, the most important wellspring of warrantless surveillance, of overbroad surveillance, of bulk surveillance, of anti-constitutional surveillance, 
gets renewed under Trump. He goes through an amazing shambolic day whereby he's against renewing 702 before um, he favors it, but he favors it in a tweet that says, oh, wait, someone told me that this is just about foreigners. Go ahead and vote for it. And that's what happens. I don't think that is remotely the kind of politics that can abolish the war on terror. That's the Trumpist, the Trumpists problem with the deep state is that they don't control the deep state. Trump's actions in the particularly the intelligence field with his purges and so forth, the creation, you know, the, the rise of um, lick spittles, uh, cronies like, um, you know, clowns like Rick Grinnell and um, John Ratcliffe, they're not there to combat a deep state. They're there to build one. So uh, let's talk about Biden. Uh, Biden emerged in uh, the Obama administration. There were hints of it that he was anti-Afghanistan, that he had rethought his foreign policy position uh, as one, you know, for much of his career, he was interested in kind of projecting American force to something else. He's the one who got us out of Afghanistan, however, you know, poorly run, uh, you know, the withdrawal might have been. Where is he, do you think, or, or what? Do, where do we go in the war on terror with Joe Biden uh, ostensibly manning the uh, ship? Well, one of the things that struck me is that um, the way Biden has made such a strident argument um, for withdrawing from Iraq, appropriately so, I believe. Afghanistan. Oh, no. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, one of the things that struck me um, is how, in my view, appropriately, stridently, uh, Biden has argued for and stuck with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. It has been interesting to watch him use uh, um, war on terror abolitionist language. But at the same time, uh, that abolition is limited um, to ground troops in Afghanistan simultaneously. Um, as a way, you know, something very familiar from, you know, Obama's, um, you know, departure from Iraq mm -hmm. um, simultaneous with um, escalation of drone strikes and escalation in Afghanistan, um, is that he reserves the right to surveil and bomb Afghanistan at will. So, you know, the, the new euphemism we're learning uh, is an over the horizon capability, which is to say drone strikes and on other occasions commando raids. He makes a point of saying in his Afghanistan withdrawal speeches that the problem with the Afghanistan war, when it's not, you know, Afghans themselves, uh, is that it distracts us from the counterterrorism challenges of today with the counterterrorism challenges of yesterday. And that's a dangerous, you know, sign that um, Biden uh, will cease um, an abolitionist perspective on the war on terror, take it no further, leave the rest of it intact and return to the kind of Obama era pattern of a less conspicuous war, which probably shouldn't surprise us because every single person in the Biden national security um, apparatus in, in positions of influence are the veterans of Obama's sustainable war on terror. You know, uh, towards the end of the book, uh, you write, and I'm paraphrasing, but you talk about how, you know, part of the reign of terror, the war on terror mentality is that the longer America sees itself as under siege, and, and we've defined things in a war, in a way, so we're always under, under siege. There is always an enemy somewhere out there, maybe deep in America, hiding in a, you know, in a, in a mosque somewhere or overseas that is going to get us. So we're under siege, but the longer we're under siege, the easier it is to see enemies everywhere. Uh, this also is an old American kind of mentality and trope. Um, what do we do to snap out of that, to get out of that? Because if we are waiting for the next real or imagined attack, and then we're going to respond you know, the way that we are because we're, we're nervous and anxious. We can never really get out of it. How do we, how do we end that kind of uh, worldview? Uh, my answer um, may not be your answer, uh, but uh, my answer is solid. I, 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 I understand it's raising the minimum wage and, you know, all of that. But oh, no. no. Oh, no. I'm not. A, I'm not. Yeah. I don't, we, we only start with raising the minimum wage. We're about some hardcore wealth redistribution. Yes. But I'm not, not about that. Yeah. Um, uh, my answer is solidarity. 
I think um, elite politics has proven over the past 20 years that it will only perpetuate the war on terror. People have to organize with one another to force their politicians into a binary choice between maintaining their political power and maintaining the war on terror. We already have had very hopeful signs um, of how this work is extremely difficult, but it can win. Um, the, the reason why both Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden play anti-war politics when it's time to get people's votes is because on a certain level, they understand that the American people, regardless of what they stand on everything else, do not want to be permanently at war. They do not want to police the globe. They do not want to set up you know, we have very different understandings probably of certain aspects of American foreign policy and that's fine. Um, but they don't wanna set up a system of domination that forces them to remain in positions. Uh, well, I shouldn't say force, that's always a choice, but um, makes elites on autopilot remain in this extractive, exploitative, um, violent uh, condition. And the, the thing that has always changed aspects of American history that function like that is agitation en masse from below. That's the only thing that's ever, frankly, made America great. The only thing that has ever redeemed America um, is movements from the American people that force their leaders to act in ways that strengthen um, the bonds of peace and social solidarity. And we have a choice to make um, and we don't have much time to make it. But I think if we actually make that choice and we can unite and stay united, then we win. One of the issues that people have come together, and I think you see this on the libertarian side of things, and I'll say the libertarian right, I don't consider myself part of the right, but no reason to kind of be uh, fastidious right now. On the libertarian right and on the progressive left over um, police, uh, police reform, and criminal justice reform and whatnot. You see that. You see it in foreign policy occasionally so that somebody like Ron Paul in the early 2000s emerges as a, a vocal critic of empire along with people like a Bernie Sanders. Um, are there other issues that you think that people, progressives and libertarians can, can kind of start to build up you know, a coalition that works at least long enough to, to generate the, that type of uh, whether it's in the streets or, you know, just in media to actually force the major parties to nominate anti-war on terror candidates for high office. As long as, you know, I've been reporting on this stuff, I've also been reporting on um, the anti-surveillance uh, coalition of libertarians, progressives, um, socialists. Um, and, you know, you know, my wife used to work for the ACLU and, you know, one of the things she always would say, and she knew this because of, you know, her work in coalition politics against the war on terror, is that you can't on Capitol Hill do anything to restrain the war on terror without forces on the right. It's just a fact. Like, with the, the anti-surveillance coalition, I think, you know, you, you really do have, you know, opportunities to expand that. Outward, I think, you know, libertarians and progressives, certainly libertarians and socialists, um, would be very into uh, the abolition of the Department of Homeland Security and use um, the abolition of the Department of Homeland Security um, to really make a kind of statement about uh, what is and is not and should not be considered respectable um, for American policy. Um, for the architecture of uh, the American government um, to uh, conduct in terms of um, not just persecution of undocumented people in the United States, but the um, massive windfalls that the Department of Homeland Security provide far more than the Pentagon. Um, to um, Bradley Balco has written about this rather compellingly, um, funding um, the militarization of police around the country. That's, you know, th those are just like two, you know, quick things, you know, off the bat. But I think like, you know, for those who believe as we do, um, that the war on terror um, is an urgency that cannot be allowed to persist, to become permanent and to further deface 
um, the United States in an anti-democratic um, direction, I think this is a real moment. I think that um, it won't happen without struggle. It won't happen without organizing. It won't happen without effort. And it certainly won't happen you know, by the you know, good graces of the Biden administration, um, a democratic controlled Congress, um, or anything you know, generating exclusively from elite politics. But I think the war on terror has shown itself as a political enterprise to be so fragile and so manipulable that politicians can easily be made to fear aligning with it, not just be made to fear um, its supposed talismanic power. All right, we're going to leave it there. Spencer Ackerman, author of Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump. Thanks for talking to Reason. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. Be well.